Chapter Three, Part One, of the Brotherhood of the Seven Kings. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Brotherhood of the Seven Kings, by L. T. Meade and Robert Eustace. Chapter Three, The Swing of the Pendulum, Part One. There was now little doubt that Madame Colucci knew herself to be in personal danger. On the Derby Day I had thrown down the gauntlet with a vengeance. Her object henceforth would be to put me out of the way. I lived in an atmosphere of intangible mystery, which was all the darker and more horrible because it was felt, not seen. By Dufrayer's advice I left the bringing of this dangerous woman to justice in his hands. He employed the cleverest and most up-to-date detectives to have her secretly watched, and from time to time they brought us their reports. Clue after clue arose. Each clue was carefully followed, but it invariably led to disappointing results. Madame eluded every effort to bring a definite charge against her. The money we were spending, however, was not entirely in vain. We learned that her influence and the wide range of her acquaintances were far beyond what we had originally surmised. Her fame as a healer, her marvelous and occult cures, the reputation of her great wealth and dazzling beauty increased daily, and I was certain that before long I should meet her in the lists. The encounter was destined to come sooner even than I had anticipated, and in a manner most unexpected. It was the beginning of the following November that I received an invitation to dine with an old friend, Harry de Brett. He was several years my senior, and had recently succeeded to his father's business in the city, an old established firm of bankers, whose house was in St. Mark's Court, Grace Church Street. Only a few days previously I had seen it announced in the society papers that a marriage had been arranged between de Brett's only daughter, Geraldine, and the Duke of Friedeck, a foreign nobleman, whose name I had seen figuring prominently at many a function the previous season. I had known Geraldine since she was a child, and was glad to have an opportunity of offering my congratulations. At the appointed hour I found myself at de Brett's beautiful house in Bayswater, and Geraldine, who was standing near her father, came eagerly forward to welcome me. She was a pretty and very young girl, with a clear olive complexion and soft dark eyes. She had the innocent and naive manner of a schoolgirl. She was delighted to see me, and began to talk eagerly. "'Come and stand by this window, Mr. Head. I am so glad you were able to come. I want to introduce you to Carl, the Duke of Friedeck, I mean. He will be here in a minute or two. As she spoke, she dropped her voice to a semi-whisper. "'You know, of course, that we are to be married soon?' she continued. "'I have heard of the engagement,' I answered, "'and I congratulate you heartily. I should like very much to meet the Duke. His name is, of course, familiar to anyone who reads the society papers.' "'He is anxious to make your acquaintance also,' she replied. "'I told him you were coming, and he said—' she paused— "'But surely the Duke of Friedeck has never heard of me before,' I answered in some surprise. "'I think he has,' she answered. "'He was quite excited when I spoke of you. I asked him if he had met you. He said no, but that you were very well known in scientific circles as a clever man. The Duke is a great scientist himself, Mr. Head, and I know he would like to have a chat with you. I am certain you will be friends.' Just at that moment the Duke was announced." He was a tall and handsome man of about five-and-thirty, with the somewhat florid complexion, blue eyes, and fair curling hair of the Teuton. He was well-dressed, and had the indescribable air of good breeding which proclaims the gentleman. I looked at him with much curiosity, being puzzled by an intangible memory of having seen his face before, where and how I could not tell. Geraldine tripped up to him and brought him to my side. "'Carl!' she cried. "'This is my friend, Mr. Head.' "'Don't you remember we talked about him this morning?' Friedeck bowed. "'I am glad to make your acquaintance,' he said to me. "'Yours is a name of distinction in the world of science.' "'That can scarcely be the case,' I answered. "'It is true I am fond of original research, but up to the present I have worked for my own pleasure alone.' "'Nevertheless, the world has whispered of you,' he replied. "'I, too, am fond of science, and have lost myself more than once in its tortuous mazes.' I have lately started a laboratory of my own, but just now other matters— He broke off abruptly, and glanced at Geraldine, who smiled and blushed. Dinner was announced. I happened to sit not far from the guest of the evening, and noticed that he was a good conversationalist. 
there was scarcely a subject mentioned on which he had not something to say, and on more than one occasion his repartee was brilliant, and his remarks touched with humour. Geraldine, in her white dress, with her soft, rather sad eyes, her manner at once bright, sweet, and timid, made a contrast to this astute-looking man of the world. I glanced from one to the other, and an uneasiness which I could scarcely account for sprang up within me. Notwithstanding his handsome appearance and his easy and courteous manner, I wondered if this man, nearly double her age, was likely to make the pretty English girl happy. As dinner progressed I observed that the Duke often took the trouble to look at me. I also noticed that whenever our eyes met he turned away. How was it possible for him to have heard of me before? Although I was a scientist, my researches were unknown to the world. I determined to take the first opportunity of solving this mystery. Soon after eleven o'clock the guests took their leave, and I was just about to follow their example when de Brett asked me to have a pipe with him in his smoking-room. As we seated ourselves by the fire, he began to talk at once of his future son-in-law. "'He is a capital fellow, is he not, Head?' exclaimed my host. "'I hope you have formed a favourable opinion of him.' "'I never form an opinion quickly,' I answered with caution. The Duke of Friedeck is certainly distinguished in appearance, and— "'Oh, you are too cautious,' cried de Brett in some irritation. "'You may take my word for it, that he is all right. This is a great catch for my little girl. Of course she will have plenty of money on her own account, but the Duke is not only of high family, he is also rich. He comes from Bavaria, and his title is absolutely genuine. Soon after the great Duke of Marlborough's wars, and almost immediately after the Battle of Blenheim, the Austrian government took possession of the dukedom of Friedeck, and, until lately, the family have remained in exile. It was only a year ago that the present duke regained his rights and all the great estates. He was introduced to us by no less a person than Madame Colucci. Ah, I see you start. You have heard of her, of course. Who has not? I replied. Do you know her? I have met her, I said. It was only with an effort I can control the ungovernable excitement which seized me at the mere mention of this woman's name. "'She dines with us next week,' continued de Brett. "'A wonderful woman, wonderful! Her cures are marvellous, but that is, after all, the least part of her interesting personality. She is so fascinating, so wise and good-natured, that men and women alike fall at her feet. As to Geraldine, she has taken an immense fancy to her.' "'Where did you first meet her?' I asked. "'In Scotland, last summer.' She was staying with my old friends, the Campbells, for a couple of nights, and Friedeck was also one of the guests. If she is a friend of yours, Head, and I rather expect so from your manner, will you dine with us again next Thursday in order to meet her? We are going down to my place, Forest Manor, in Essex, and Madame is to stay with us for a couple of nights. We expect quite a large party, and can give you a bed. Will you come? I wish I could, but I fear it will be impossible, I replied. It is true that I know Madame Colucci, but— I broke off. Don't ask me any more at the moment, de Brett. The fact is, your news has excited me, you will say, unreasonably. De Brett gazed at me with earnestness. You have fallen under the spell of the most beautiful woman in London, he said after a pause. Is that so, Head? You may put it that way if you like, I said, but I cannot explain myself to-night. Be assured, however, of my deep interest in this matter— "'Pray tell me anything more you may happen to know with regard to the Duke of Friedeck.' "'You certainly are a strange fellow,' said my host. "'You are wearing at the present moment an air of quite painful mystery. However, here goes. You wish to hear about the Duke. I have nothing but good to tell of him. He is a rich man, and dabbles now and then on the stock exchange, but not to any serious extent. A week ago he arranged for a loan from my bank, depositing as security some of the most splendid diamonds I have ever seen. They are worth a king's ransom, and each stone is historical. He brought the diamonds away from the estates in Bavaria, and they are to be reset and presented to Geraldine just before the wedding. How large was the amount of the loan? I asked. De Brett raised his eyebrows. He evidently thought I was infringing on privileges, even of an old friend. Compared with the security, the loan was a trifling one he said after a pause, not more than ten thousand pounds. Friedeck will pay me back next week, as he wishes to release the diamonds, in order to have them ready to give to Geraldine on her wedding day. "'And when do you propose that the wedding shall take place?' I continued. "'Ah, you have me there, Head. That is the painful part. 
You know what my motherless girl is to me. Well, the Duke insists upon taking her away between now and Christmas. They are to spend Christmas in the old feudal style in the old castle in Bavaria. It is a great wrench parting from the little one, but she will be happy. I never met a man I took more warmly to than Karl Duke of Friedrich. You can see for yourself that the child is devoted to him. I can, I said. I will wish you good night now, Debrett. Be assured once again of my warm interest in all that concerns you and Geraldine. I shook hands with my host, and a moment later found myself in the street. I called a hansom and desired the man to drive straight to Defrayer's flat in Shaftesbury Avenue. He had just come in and welcomed me eagerly. "'By all that's fortunate, Head!' he exclaimed. "'I was just on my way to see you.' "'Then we have met well,' I answered. "'Dufrayer, I have come here on a most important matter. But first of all, tell me, have you ever heard of the Duke of Friedeck?' "'The Duke of Friedeck?' cried Dufrayer. "'Why, it was on that very subject I wished to see you. You have, of course, observed the announcement of his approaching marriage in the society papers?' "'I have,' I replied. "'He is engaged to Geraldine de Brett. I have been dining at de Brett's house to-night, and met the Duke at dinner. De Brett has been telling me all about him. De Freyer, I have learned to my consternation that the man was introduced to the de Bretts by Madame Colucci. That fact is quite enough to rouse my suspicions, but I see you have something to communicate on your own account. What is it? Sit down, Head. You know, of course, that I am having Madame watched. The Duke of Friedrich is beyond doubt one of her satellites, and I am strongly inclined to think that this is a new plot brewing." "'Just my own opinion,' I replied. "'But tell me what you know. "'I was coming to see you, "'for I hope that you might remember the Duke's name "'from your old association with the Brotherhood. "'I do not recall it, but names mean nothing. "'The man is handsome and has the manners of a gentleman. "'When he entered de Brett's drawing-room, "'I thought for a moment that I must have met him before, "'but that idea quickly vanished. "'Nevertheless, he contrived to arouse my suspicions "'by more than one stealthy glance which he favoured me with, even before his connection with Madame Colucci was mentioned. I regard him now as a highly suspicious individual, and I fully believe he is playing some game a little deeper than appears. "'Beyond doubt, the man has plenty of money and moves in good circles,' said Defrayer. "'He is known, however, to live a pretty fast life. He shoots at Hurlingham, drives his own drag, rents a moor in Scotland, and has a suite at the Hotel Cecil.' but nothing can be discovered against him except that he is constantly seen in Madame's company. "'And that is quite enough,' I replied. "'Friedeck is one of Madame's satellites. Without doubt there is mischief ahead.' "'I agree with you,' said de Freyer. "'I think it more than possible that this plausible duke is simply another serpent springing from the head of this modern Bedusa. In that case de Brett ought to be warned.' I rose uneasily. "'I would have warned him to-night,' I answered but I want more evidence. How are we to get it? Tyler's agents are doing their best, and Madame is closely watched. Yes, but that woman could deceive the devil himself, I said bitterly. That is true, answered de Freyer, and to show our hand too soon might be fatal. We cannot move in this matter until we have got more circumstantial evidence. How are we to set to work is the puzzle. Well, I said, I shall move heaven and earth in this matter. I have known Geraldine since she was a child, she is a sweet, innocent, motherless girl. The great risk to her happiness that may now be impending is too serious to contemplate quietly. If I had time, I should go to Bavaria in order to find out if the Duke's story is true, but in any case, it might be well to send one of Tyler's agents to look up the supposed estates. "'I will do so,' said de Freyer. "'And in the meantime, I shall watch,' I said, "'and if an opportunity occurs, believe me, de Brett shall have his warning.' As I spoke, I bade my friend good night and returned to my own house. The next few days were spent in anxious thought, but no immediate action seemed possible. Clue after clue still arose, but only to vanish into nothing. I seldom now went into society without hearing Madame Colucci's name, and all the accounts of her were favorable. She was the sort of woman to charm the eye and fire the imagination. Her personal attractions were some of her strongest potentialities. On the following Tuesday, as I was walking down Oxford Street, a brougham drew up suddenly at the pavement. The window was lowered, and a girlish face looked eagerly out. "'Mr. Head,' cried Geraldine de Brett eagerly, "'you are the very man I want. Come here, I have something to say.' I approached her at once. 
"'We are dreadfully disappointed at your refusing to come to us on Thursday,' she continued. "'We are making up a delightful party. My father and I are going down to Forest Manor for a fortnight, in order to have plenty of room to entertain our friends. This is a personal matter with me. I ask you to come to us as a personal favor. Will you refuse?' I looked full into the sparkling and lovely eyes of the young girl. The color came and went in her cheeks. She laid one of her small hands for a moment on mine. "'I must tell you everything,' she continued eagerly. "'Of course I want you, but I am not the only one. Madame Colucci, ah, you have heard of her?' "'Who has not?' was my cautious reply. "'Yes, but, Mr. Head, you are concealing something. Madame is one of your very greatest friends. She has told me so. It is only an hour since I left her. She is most anxious to meet you on Thursday at our house. I promised you should be there. Wasn't it rash of me?' but I made up my mind that I would insist on your coming. Now you won't allow me to break my word, will you? Did Madame Colucci really say that she wished to see me? I asked. As I put the question, I felt my face turning pale. I looked again, full at Mr. Brett. It was evident that she misinterpreted my emotion. Well, that mattered nothing. I quickly made up my mind. I had an engagement for Thursday, I said, but your word is law. I cannot refuse you. Geraldine laughed. "'Madam, doubted my power to bring you, but I knew you would come if I could really see you. Suppose we had not met in this chance sort of way. I was going to your house. I had no intention of leaving a stone unturned. Without you, my party will not be complete. Yes, you will come, and it is all right. You will hear from father to-morrow. He very often drives out to Forest Manor from the bank, and perhaps you can arrange to come with him. But you will get all the particulars straight from him.' "'Thank you a thousand times. You have made me a happy girl.' She waved her hand to me in farewell, and the brougham rolled out of sight. My blood was coursing quickly through my veins, and my mind was made up. Madame would not wish me to meet her at de Brett's house without a strong reason. With her usual astuteness she was using Geraldine de Brett as her tool in more senses than one. I must not delay another moment in warning the banker.' Calling a hansom, I desired the man to drive me straight to Debrett's bank in the city, and soon after twelve o'clock I found myself in Grace Church Street. In a few moments the hansom turned down a narrow lane leading into St. Mark's Court. Here I paid my driver, and a moment later found myself in the open space in front of the bank. This was a cul-de-sac, but there was another lane leading into it also from Grace Church Street, running parallel to the one I had come down, and separated from it by a narrow row of buildings, which came to an abrupt termination about fifty feet from the houses forming the farther side of the court. Well, as I knew to Brett, I had not been at the old bank for some years, and looked around me now eagerly, until my eye fell upon the large brass plate bearing the well-known name. I entered the office, and going up to the counter, asked if Mr. de Brett were in. The clerk replied in the affirmative, and giving him my card, he passed through a door into an inner room. The next moment he reappeared and requested me to step inside. I found de Brett seated at a writing-table, upon which a circle of light fell from a shaded incandescent. "'Welcome, Head!' he exclaimed, rising and coming forward with his usual heartiness of manner. "'To what am I indebted for this visit? Sit down! I am delighted to see you. By the way, Geraldine tells me—' "'I have just met your daughter,' I interrupted, "'and it is principally on account of that meeting "'that I have come here to trouble you during business hours.' "'Oh, I can spare you ten minutes,' he answered, "'looking around him as he spoke. "'The fact is, Head, Geraldine is anxious "'that you should join our party at Forest Manor, "'and I wish you would reconsider your determination. "'The Duke has taken a fancy to you, "'and as you happen to know Madame Colucci, "'it would be a pleasure to us all "'if you would give us the benefit of your society "'for a night or two. "'I have promised Geraldine to come,' I answered gravely. "'But, de Brett, you must pardon me. "'I have intruded on you in your business hours "'to speak on a most delicate private matter. "'However you may receive what I have to say, "'I must ask you to hear it in confidence, "'and with that good feeling that has prompted me to come to you.' "'My dear Head, what do you mean? "'Pray, explain yourself.' "'I am uneasy,' I continued, "'very uneasy. "'I am also in a peculiar position,' and cannot disclose the reason of my fears. You are pleased with the match which Geraldine is about to make. Now I have reasons for doubting the Duke of Friedeck, reasons which I cannot at the present moment disclose, but I am bound, 
yes, bound Debrett in your girl's interests to warn you as to your dealings with him. Debrett looked at me through his gold-rimmed spectacles with a blank expression of amazement. If it were any other man who spoke to me in this strain, he said at last, I believe I should show him the door. Are you aware, Head, that this is a most serious allegation? You are bound in all honour to explain yourself. I cannot do so at the present moment. I can only repeat that my fears are grave. All I ask of you is to use double caution, to find out all you can about the man's antecedents. Debrett interrupted me, rising hastily from his seat. In our dealings one with the other, he said, this is the first time in which you have shown bad taste. I shall see the Duke this afternoon, and shall be bound to acquaint him, in his and my own interests, with your communications. I hope you won't do so. Remember, my warning is given in confidence. It is not fair to give a man such a warning, and then to give him no reason for it, retorted the banker. I will give you my reasons. When? On Thursday night. Will you regard my confidence as sacred until then? You have disturbed me considerably but I will do so. I should be sorry to alarm Geraldine unnecessarily. I am quite certain you are mistaken. You never saw the Duke until you met him at my house? That I believe to be true, but I cannot say anything further now. I will explain my reasons fully on Thursday night. Debrett rose from his seat. He bade me good-bye, but not with his customary friendliness. I went away to pass the time until Thursday in much anxiety." After grave thought I resolved, if I discovered nothing fresh with regard to Friedeck, to acquaint Debrett with what I knew of Madame Colucci. If Geraldine married the Duke, she should at least do so with her father's eyes opened. I little guessed, however, when I made these plans, what circumstances were about to bring forth. End of chapter 3, part 1